what's the opposite of a trigger warning? Because whatever that is, this video should contain it right from the off because this is a video that is not gonna rile you up. It's not gonna get you excited. In fact, the whole thing runs at a rather sedate pace. So if you're looking for something that's gonna get your adrenaline going, well, this is not the video you're looking for. No, today we're gonna to be taking a look at a reel of audio tape. And I say we because I've got a special guest star in this one, but I think we should take things right back to the beginning when I received an email from a chap called Mart. Hi Matt, I have something which might be right up your street, a reel of transmitter breakdown announcements and music from the early 1960s. I inherited a pile of tapes when a relative of mine recently died. In his youth, he was a lineman. His job was to scale terrifying heights to fix problems at the top of telegraph poles and transmitters, which I think is how I come to have this tape. It's a 5-inch reel of double-play BASF tape and it was made to be played out from the transmitter when there was a local breakdown. It probably came from Sutton Coldfield Transmitter. Well, as you can imagine, that caught my attention, so he sent over the tape. Here it is, and let's take a nice, leisurely look at it. OK, well, first off, let's see what the box tells us about the tape that's inside. Well, clearly it's from BASF, that's the Barden Aniline and Soda Factory, and the tape is an LGS26. In the LGS range, you can also get a 35 and a 52. The number refers to the thickness of the tape in micrometers or microns. The 26, therefore, is the thinnest of the tapes, which means it will hold the most on a reel of this size compared to the other ones. It's referred to as a double play tape. If you got the 35, that would be a long play, and the 52 would be the standard play. The fact they've gone for the 26 tells me that they wanted to get the longest play time out of this size of tape, which might indicate that the machine that they were playing this back on couldn't hold larger tapes, so they had to use a five inch tape, which is what this is, but use the thinnest type of tape on it. Now on this side, we can see what's on the tape. We've got a standard breakdown sequence. They put 28 minutes on here and a reduced power sequence on side two. 29 minutes 30 so it's approximately a 30 minute tape and it's running at seven and a half inches per second which therefore tells you that they wanted it to have a decent quality otherwise they'd run it at a slower speed but they also wanted to try and get around about half an hour out to each side now on the spine here on this sticker is printed m9 and that is also mentioned on the front there so some kind of cataloging system no doubt and finally before i open it up just one thing to mention at the top here it says breakdown announcements and holding music now i used to deal with telephone hold music systems and we always refer to it as hold music but i now realize that's an abbreviation really of holding music which makes a lot more sense like a holding pattern for an aircraft right well let's open this up it's one of these hinged boxes one thing I think you might find interesting, notice here it says cassette number, which means box number. Cassette meaning small box. Of course, this is from the days before the cassette, or at least the type of tape is, but you can see where we've got the terminology of cassette from because it's the box for the tape. Talking of years, this particular style of tape, this was made between 1958 and 1969. So it does narrow down the year a little bit. We know it can't have been recorded before 1958, but of course it could go all the way up to 1969. So it doesn't narrow it down too much, but I suspect it is really the earlier part of the 1960s. Reduced power or standard breakdown. Sounds like my typical week. But anyway, we've got our tape here now. So let us spool this onto a tape player and have a listen to it. Okay, so that's on there. We're going to be playing side one, standard breakdown, and we'll select the tape speed of seven and a half inches per second. Now I'm just going to start off by listening through this monitor speaker, and then we can hook it up to the PCM recorder and copy the whole thing across. So we'll just listen to the start of this, make sure the volume's turned up. We are sorry that we have a breakdown. We are trying to put things right just as quickly as we can, and we shall rejoin the advertised program as soon as possible. Okay, I've got it all hooked up, ready to record, so I'll rewind it in a second. But did you notice there that the announcement kicked in right at the start? So no doubt this thing was queued up, ready to go. As soon as something went wrong, this thing was sprung into life, and the very first thing that it did was play that announcement to say there was a fault. There was no delay, or as minimal delay as possible. OK, so I'll just rewind this back to the beginning and we'll get the recording going. Now, I did notice in some of the sections that I was playing there in the background, there was a little bit of distortion. There was perhaps some worn sections of the tape, so bear that in mind. 
when I come to play some of this back, but I'm sure it'll be quite interesting to have a listen to. So I'll just wait for the counter here to get back to zero. We'll start off the recording and I'll record the whole thing across, flip it over and then record the other side as well. Okay, so I've got everything recorded across just fine. And I think the first thing I should do is play you a nice clean direct dub of that first announcement because it reminded me a little bit of the this is a journey into sound that you heard all over the place at one point. And I think this would be ripe for sampling. So I'll play you that first of all. And then after that's played, you'll hear the first track that comes in straight away on the tape. And I'll talk about that in a bit more detail. But here we go. Press play and record now. We are sorry that we have a breakdown. We are trying to put things right just as quickly as we can, and we shall rejoin the advertised program as soon as possible. Now that piece of music carries the unmistakable sound of the BBC Radiophonic Workshop and indeed that's where it originated. This was an interval signal created by Madalena Fagandini and after hearing a broadcast of it, a pre-Beatles George Martin reworked the tune into a music single released as Time Beat in 1961 under the pseudonym Ray Cathode. Madalena started at the Radiophonic Workshop in 1959, so that narrows down our tape as being put together sometime after that date. But since it's the original version on here, rather than the 1961 remix, this is the closest we're going to get to a firm date. The rest of the tape contains a variety of light music that no doubt comes from the BBC archive, likely music that was recorded in-house. It's clarinet heavy, but there's some pretty pleasant tunes on here as well. There is one reoccurring piece of music, though. For anyone unfamiliar, that's Oranges and Lemons, a traditional tune with the earliest printed version dating back to 1744. And it can't be a coincidence that both this and Interval Signal relate somewhat to clocks. While the 30-minute tape runs out, the music refers to the passage of time, something the engineers working on fixing the fault were probably all too aware of. Now, here's the breakdown of the breakdown audio as a waveform. I'm going to colour code it to make it easier to show the progression and the repetition. So it starts off with the announcement in red, and then there's the Radiophonic Workshop interval signal, followed by two pieces of calming music, then back to the same announcement again, followed by oranges and lemons, and so on. The pattern in this centre section repeats. However, besides oranges and lemons, each music track played here is different. But you can see that the start and end follow a different pattern to the centre section. These are the only times when the interval signal piece is played. And I've got to think that this was used as a way to identify where the tape had got up to purely by listening to it. The public would be unaware of this. But if an engineer heard the interval signal followed by oranges and lemons, he'd know that the half hour tape had nearly been played out and perhaps it was time to spool up another one. Interestingly, each of the five snippets of oranges and lemons is performed in a different style. Have a listen. So that's how side one of the tape finishes, by which point I'm sure that everyone involved had hoped that whatever had caused the breakdown had been resolved. So after that, I flipped the tape over and recorded the other side, the reduced power sequence. 
Okay, so that's the second side recorded across. It's just running through the end of the tape here. There's a bit spare at the end, but um, it's raised a question, this one. You see, I understand how you'd use the first side of the tape. It was all queued up, ready to go. As soon as there's a problem, it could play that announcement. This side is different. It's a tails out recording. So that means that you first have to wind it onto a different reel before you can play it. And you really don't want to be winding tapes across when you want to play something immediately. I don't know whether this was just a backup recording, because in a real situation it would make more sense to have the same thing on either side of the tape. So it doesn't matter which way you've ended up with it, you can just put it in a machine and play it, and have a different recording for the low power situation on a different tape. Having different recordings on either side really doesn't make a heck of a lot of sense. Yeah, more questions than answers, I'm afraid. As you'd imagine, this side contains a similar sequence of announcements interspersed with music. Of course, the announcements here are different and also a little bit more in depth. I'm sorry to tell you that a transmission fault has developed and it'll be necessary for a short time to reduce power. We suggest that you increase the volume of your sound and also adjust your vision contrast control. We shall return to normal service just as soon as we can repair the fault. So here's the sequence of audio this time, and whilst, as before, the same announcement gets repeated multiple times, you can see here that there is a longer version at around the 18-minute mark. So let's have a listen to this one in full. This is the BBC television service. Here is a special announcement. The television pictures seen by viewers in this part of the country are received by radio from one of the BBC's high-power transmitters and then rebroadcast from your local transmitter. For various reasons outside the control of the BBC, reception of the picture sometimes deteriorates to such an extent that it cannot be rebroadcast. When this happens, we fade out the picture completely and replace it on your screens with a local test signal, which appears as a vertical white bar. We radiate this so that you may know it is the rebroadcast which is at fault and not your set. There are also occasions when the picture received at your local transmitter falls below standard but is not poor enough to switch off altogether. In these circumstances, so that you may again know the fault is not in your set, we shall in future radiate the white bar for two seconds every three minutes until the picture returns to normal. Now, I'm sure you've noticed that I'm not an expert in anything. I never claim to be. I'm just a chap who knows a little bit about a few things. But when it comes to things like this, I've completely exhausted my own knowledge. And yet I want to know more about it. Where and when would this tape have been used? I need to speak to someone who knows all about radio telecommunications and transmitters and that whole field. And the person that sprang to mind immediately was Lewis from the Ringway Manchester channel here on YouTube. So I got in touch with him and he kindly agreed to have a listen to the tapes, and here's what he had to say about it. Hi Matt, thanks for having me on the channel. I've taken the time to listen to the tapes you sent, and there's material here for two eventualities. The first being the service outage, and the second being reduced power. Both of these mainly relate to the use of a backup transmitter. So, they're obviously from around the 1960s, so would have been standard practice at all major television and radio transmitting stations. Starting with the service outage tape, and viewers may ask, how do they play a tape with a service outage? Well, that's where the backup transmitter comes in. On the main transmitter, there would have been what's called a silence detection system, and their design and level of technological features has advanced over the years. They work on a basic principle, however. They detect silence on the air in their simplest form by analysing the audio signal and comparing the amplitude to a set threshold. If it spots a dip, it'll trigger a warning or a backup transmitter after a certain amount of time has passed. Let's say, for example, Crystal Palace main transmitter goes off the air, the silence detection system could be an important part of getting the backup transmitter in Croydon on the air very quickly. 
There are other more complex ways of doing this today, but it's a feature you'd commonly find being kept awake for want of a better term on something like a state funeral or Big Brother, where there's long periods of silence. If you cast your mind back to when the housemates would be asleep at night, you'd get bursts of birdsong and aircraft going over. Well, that's to stop the silence detection triggering. At a state funeral, the same birdsong or another source of audio would be played on the signal. The method of playing these tapes varied from manual and automatic reel-to-reels, tape players and later CD players, with again more modern systems in use today. What's worth noting is back in the 1960s there was far less redundancy and automation, so these large broadcast sites were manned 24-7. This means there would be a good chance that a silence detection system was beaten by an alert engineer. Moving on to the second tape, the low power message, and this has a more simple explanation. Transmitter sites such as Sutton Coldfield, Alexandra Palace and Crystal Palace, all the big ones and indeed many smaller ones, have reserved transmitters. Some are located on the main site and some are located nearby. If work needs to be carried out on a main antenna, the reserve is switched on. These are often lower down the mast and sometimes emit a weaker signal, so to save swarms of angry listeners phoning in to complain, a lower power message would be played on the reserve transmitter to explain why the signal is weaker. This isn't always done in the case of a main transmitter outage either. If maintenance needs to be carried out nearby on the mast, and the main transmitter can be left on, they'll often reduce the power to a safer level for workers so as not to expose them to extremely high levels of RF. Well, that's something I've learned. I always knew that in broadcasting, dead air was undesirable, but I had no idea that if it went on for too long, it might trigger some automated backup process. If you enjoy learning facts like this and anything related to radio telecommunications, I really do recommend that you visit the Ringway Manchester channel. I'll have a link in the video description. I'll pin something in the top comment as well, or just search for Ringway Manchester here on YouTube. And thanks again to Lewis for sharing that information. And on this one, I know he wanted to fill me in with more information about the playback side of things. He was waiting on some chap to come back to him, but unfortunately that fell through. He never heard back from the fella. I think it was some guy that used to do this for a living, so maybe he's just getting on in years. But look, if you ever worked inside one of these transmitter stations, you were in charge of messing around with the tapes and you had to press play or put it on a machine, just put some information in the comments. It'd be nice to hear a little bit more about this. Now, this whole video would not have been possible without the original tape being sent over from Mart and I've got to thank him for sending this across because even though his relative's gone the story's lived on because he stored this tape for all those years perhaps nobody's heard this for 60 plus years so it's a really fascinating little piece of history uh, not greatly significant in its own right but it just opens up a little window into a particular time and place and a piece of our history so thanks to Mart for sending this one over but that's it for the moment as always, thanks for watching. <laughs>